Hello and welcome to our continued lessons on the book of Hebrews, a remarkable book. And just a couple of things for clarification I wanted to, uh, to point out. It is my belief and the belief of quite a few uh, Bible scholars that uh, the book of Hebrews was written uh, by the Apostle Paul. And I'm going to also agree with that based on uh, some things, as I'll point out through the lesson, consistencies with other uh, writings we know were from Paul, but I don't want to make that a point of contention. It's just easier for me to say Paul says in the book of Hebrews. Also, um, I, I'd like to uh, let you know that as I reference any particular scriptures or read any scriptures, uh, that they will be from the English Standard Version of the Bible. Uh, certainly, if you have a different version, I encourage you to use that. Uh, it, it would be fine to do so. Uh, this particular lesson that I'm looking at today is from Hebrews uh, chapter 11. I'm sorry, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 1, 2, and 3. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. So uh, you might want to turn to that and uh, be able to look at the key points that I'll be bringing out from that lesson. I, I want to welcome you to this lesson. Thank you for uh, tuning in and looking at this recording. It may not be the best way to present a lesson, uh, but it, it does work for us. And uh, I encourage you uh, to participate in Bible study as often as you can and as long as you can. Uh, God's Word is gracious to us. Uh, it, it points us in the direction toward God's will. All right, let's talk about Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. We've already established in the uh, prior studies that the overriding theme of the book of Hebrews is, is the superiority of Jesus over everything. Paul has shown the superiority of Jesus over the old law, uh, every element of it, whether in process or sacrifice, uh, intent, uh, worship, those who lead worship as in the uh, priest. He then shows how it's critical that we develop our faith for without it, as he says in Hebrews chapter uh, 12, verse 6, it's impossible to please God. He then shows us a string in, of, of heroes from old that demonstrated their faith. And this is found in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. So Paul will now build upon the importance of faith by showing us how our faith is based in and through Jesus. He'll remind us of the great cloud of witnesses that he uh, has there in chapter 11, but he's not using the word witness here as a spectator, such as someone seeing an event. Rather, he's talking about those that bear witness, much the same way as in a courtroom. We can look at them and understand from them. We can, we can use them as those who provide evidence, and in this case, the evidence of the truth about the importance of faith and how our faith is a part of our lives. And although we may not communicate uh, with those heroes of faith directly, as we study their lives, we, we should be encouraged in a like manner to develop a strong faith. Uh, by their lives, they, they bore witness to the value of faith. Uh, their lives encourage us to run the race of faith that Paul talks about in Hebrews 12. Now, these heroes of faith in chapter 11, they were not perfect. They were fallible. They were flawed. They, they struggled with their faith at times, just as all of us do. And, and I'm so thrilled when I read God's word and I understand that he does not demand a complete or perfect faith. He demands us to be faithful and, and to demonstrate that faithfulness in our lives. And so as we follow in the footsteps of others who have successfully run the race of faith, there are, there are things necessary that we'll be looking at in our text. And so in this lesson, we'll look at what Paul teaches us about running the race faithfully and how Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Let's begin now by reading Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 1, 2, and 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, 
and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He goes on to say, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. All right, so let's talk about now what, what Paul points out to us about running this great race of, race of faith. We need to lay aside some things, as he says there, uh, we're, we're, we're just surrounded by witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight. By the way, I want to point out that Paul begins this chapter by the word, therefore, indicating a transition from the 11th chapter into the 12th chapter. These, these chapter designations were put in there to help us navigate through scriptures, but it doesn't stop one's thought and start a new one. This is a continuation of what faith is and the importance of faith. And, and as he says, we're surrounded by witnesses, going back to the 11th chapter, the list of, of heroes that he had there. But, but he now talks about, he's comparing it to running. And so he, he says to let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance. The, the runner who seeks to win will, will lose as much weight as possible. Uh, they don't want to be encumbered by weight. And, and this will hurt their performance. It'll slow them down. They don't want to. Even a little bit of weight has tendency not only to slow them down, but to tire them out. And, and a, a runner, if you note, will wear clothing that is light, that allows freedom of movement. So excess weight and restrictive clothing, those kinds of things can be the difference between victory or defeat. And so he says, we too must lay aside every weight. These are things in our lives that affect our lives, that slow down our spiritual growth. For example, in Luke chapter 21, starting in verses 34, uh, the writer talks about carousing and drunkenness and cares of this life. Uh, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, uh, 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2, uh, James 1, 21, we see things like anger and malice and wrath and blasphemy and filthy language. All of these things that we ought to remove from our lives. And, and, and Paul doesn't just say remove these things, but he also talks about how, what to replace them with. So it's not just an empty life. Such things as that, that make running the race of faith difficult, if not impossible at times. There, there are barriers that Satan will set up in our way, in our spiritual growth, or we will ourselves set up these, these barriers and we'll give in to them. And so don't, don't give in to these barriers, the, these things that we take on in our lives. He, he uses the expression, uh, the sin which so easily ensnares us. Any and all sin should be laid aside. And, and I know how difficult that can, can be at times, but we can lay aside uh, those, those sins, those, those barriers, those encumbrances in our lives. I refer you to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, the words of Jesus himself, the great invitation that Jesus gives us. What a wonderful invitation it is. He says in verse 28, Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So Paul says, take those things off of you. Jesus says, lay them on me. You see, Jesus carries the load for us of our lives. We can turn these things over to Jesus as part of our faith. So any and all sin should be laid aside. And from the context of, of uh, Hebrews 11 and 12, really and truly, we're talking about faith. So the context of the sin that Paul's talking about here would be a lack of faith or unbelief in God. The, the, the letter is written to encourage faithfulness to Christ and to his covenant. And we see warnings against unbelief uh, as we studied earlier. But in, in Hebrews chapter 3, verses uh, 12 and 13, uh, there's warning against unbelief. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses uh, 26 through 39, uh, when, when one no longer believes, then the race is lost. So with a full assurance of faith, and with every hindrance laid aside, we can run the race of faith as God intended us to run. But as we comprehend the true nature of the course that's set before us, we can appreciate the need for the element of endurance. The course is long and difficult, but there is a finish line, and that's what we're focusing on. So as is Paul's custom when teaching, he tells us what to remove. 
and then tells us what to take on. That's what he does now in this passage. We remove the sin and we take on endurance. We need to have endurance because it is a, a marathon. It's not a dash. Uh, it, it does not require a quick burst of energy in which the race is soon over. And the course is not smooth. It's not straight. It's winding. It's full of obstacles. The, it, it's hilly. It's curved. It's dangerous. And it's not for the faint of heart. And many times we just cannot do it ourselves. That's why we lay our burdens on Jesus. That's why we have faith in our Lord. Jesus often taught his patience concerning the need for endurance. He would often use the concept of patience. Uh, the parable of the sower in Luke uh, chapter 8. Uh, in preparing the disciples for the limited commission in Matthew 10 verse 22. Also, by the way, as he, as he gave his discourse on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 24, 13. In both of those cases, he uses the expression, he who endures to the end will be saved. And that's what a runner does. Uh, in, in my youth, I, I, I ran distance races. I would run the mile race or I would run cross country. And a cross country race can be three to five miles long. And, and you knew that this was a long race, so you didn't do a quick burst at the front and use up all of your energy. You understood it was a marathon. It was a distance race. And so you would set a pace and you would stay with it, even when you were uncomfortable, even when the trail that you were running on might be difficult. You maintained your pace. You, you knew where you were going and you kept your eyes focusing on that finish line so that you would, you would endure to the end. The writer of Hebrews uh, has had stressed this virtue earlier in, uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 11 through 15. He appealed to the example of Abraham. Uh, in the book of, of Habakkuk, in Hebrews 10, rather, uh, verses 36 through 39, he quotes from Habakkuk. And, and so we can develop such patience, such endurance with the help of scriptures. As we, as we read of the faithfulness of God, who fulfills his promises. We read of the ultimate end of those uh, who, who persevere in their faithfulness. Uh, they will be saved. And that's a promise from our Lord. How great and wonderful is that promise. Paul wrote that eternal life would be given to those who by patience, uh, patient continuance in doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Romans chapter 2, verse 7. Therefore, endurance is required to successfully run the race of faith. Equally important as endurance is where we have our mind focused. And Paul talks to that here uh, in Hebrews chapter 12. We focus on the finish, not the pain and discomfort of the moment. We need to focus on Jesus. That's what he says in verses two and three. He says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So we look unto Jesus. Our focus must be upon the Lord as we run this race. We might, we, we might glance at others. Um, uh, Hebrews 11, for example, we look at those as they're running the race, but we get from that, we draw from that uh, encouragement. But again, I want to point out that they were infallible. They were imperfect. But we look at that as well, and we look at how in the end they're considered heroes of faith because although they might have stumbled, their faith at times might have been weak, just as ours is. They endured to the end, and, and as such then were counted uh, worthy and righteous by God. We're able to focus on the Savior, uh, the only one that is able to save us in the end. We don't look at our lives because if we're looking at our righteousness, we fail. But if we're looking to Jesus, that's the perfect example. Jesus is the author of our faith and the finisher of our faith. Some versions use the term perfecter, which means completeness. Uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 talks about the start and the end. Uh, Revelations chapter 1, verses 8 and, and 11 talks about the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. Uh, Jesus is the starter and the finisher. You know, when someone runs a race, everyone lines up on the starting line. 
and a starter is going to say, ready, set, go, or we'll, we'll fire off a, a pistol or something to indicate everybody start. So they all start at the same time. And then as they cross the finish line, uh, that, that person is going to be there or somebody will be there to designate it is finished. And, and that's what Jesus is. He's the author, in other words, the starter, and he's also the finisher of our faith. But it's interesting that not only is Jesus the starter and the finisher of our faith, he runs with us. Isn't that a great thought? And, and not only has he run with us, but he's run before us. He blazed the trail for us. He, he ran the race himself. He, as a forerunner, he entered into the heavenly sanctuary, Hebrews chapter 6, 19 and 20. He opened up a new and living way for us, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20. And now he helps us finish the race ourselves, uh, Hebrews chapter 7, 25. I, I, again, I, I, in, in my days, uh, uh, my youth as a runner, uh, sometimes I ran as a team member. Uh, uh, sometimes I would run individually as part of the team, but other times there may be a few of us on the team that were running at the same time. And we would encourage one another. We would pace one another. Somebody might run before us to, to clear the way, as it were, uh, to, to maybe uh, uh, cause the wind to not be so strong against us. Uh, we would rotate those positions to encourage one another and make the way easier. And sometimes uh, it's, it, I've, I've been a part of a group that was running where we might even link our arms around somebody who was tiring out and to, to help them to take on the load, as it were, as they're running in this. So that's what Jesus does for us. He encourages us. He ran it ahead of us, and he's running it with us. Well, that, brothers and sisters, that ought to give you some comfort. We're, we are not in this ourselves. God tells us that, yes, we work out our own salvation, but Jesus is there with us. The Holy Spirit is there with us to guide us and encourage us. What a, what a comfort that needs to be. So Jesus succeeded in running the race by looking at the joy set before him. That's what Hebrews 12 and 2 says. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He had a long-term view. He wasn't looking at the now and, and letting that stop him. He knew what the end of it would be and worked towards that. So the, the joy that inspired him, of course, was, was likely the, the privilege of being seated at the right hand of God, as, as the author says here. And so with the anticipation of such joy, Jesus endured the cross, the physical pain. He despised the shame. That's the emotional and spiritual agony that he went through. And just as Jesus looked at the joy set before him, so can we. Um, and We must look to Jesus. Paul says here uh, that we must consider him. That's in verse 3. Uh, it, to consider means to, to pay attention to, to, to think about as adding value. And, and so we must consider how Jesus endured, not only the cross, but, but even before that, as, as, he, as he lived his life and, and the shame and ridicule uh, that he endured, the hostility from sinners against himself. The hostility is something he experienced frequently as we read through the life of Christ, the times when uh, even they, they tried to even stone him at times to kill him, and they, they looked for every opportunity to ridicule him and to tear down his message, and in some cases even deserted him, some of his disciples. So many times he was ridiculed and doubted, even by those who should have recognized him. And when we meditate upon our Lord, that means to think about, to consider. Uh, it, it prevents us from becoming weary and discouraged in our souls because we see Jesus has done it and he is helping us do it as well. That's what we think about. That's what we consider. We cannot run with endurance if we become weary and discouraged. And Satan wants to cause us to doubt God. He wants us to cause us to, he, he causes us to want to doubt ourselves he wants us to give up. Those of us that, that have put on Christ, Satan wants to weaken our faith. He wants to weaken our effectiveness as we live our faith and we run that race. 
And certainly those of you that have not put on Christ in baptism, Satan wants to prevent you from doing that. He doesn't even want you to start the race before. He'll use tactics to make you think, I, I just can't do this. I, I, I can't be like those Christians. I, I'm such a sinner. Yes, you can. You're not doing it yourself. You're laying the burden on Jesus. Jesus died for our sins. He takes on our sins. We turn it over to him and we live faithful lives. But as we consider the Lord and his example, uh, we, you know, we're, we're waiting upon the Lord. Uh, we will not grow weary and we will not faint as long as we keep our eyes on the goal and we focus on Christ. Running the race, let, let me conclude, running the race of faith requires both giving up and taking on aspects of it. The giving up is that we lay aside the things that hinder us, now those, those negative things in our lives. And we take on the positive things. We, we keep our focus on Jesus, who, is, who has made our salvation possible. In both cases, knowledge of and applying God's word is critical, for in it we learn what sorts of things we must lay aside, and we learn what we must take on. And, and we learn about our Lord, what he endured, and how his example should inspire us. Thank you very, very much for listening to this lesson, and, and I, I pray that uh, you gain from it.